Sally. Well, uh, how about introducing the next? Um, should we? Do you want to introduce? Or should, yeah, yeah, you, you, you'll introduce it. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Willie Littleschild, International Chief for Treaties Number Six, Seven, and Eight, member of the Ermine Skin Cree Nation, former rapporteur of the UN Permanent Forum for six years, and first two time chairperson rapporteur for MRIP during two terms, former member of parliament and vice president of the indigenous parliament of the Americas, member of the order of Canada, eight sport halls of fame, including Canada's sport hall of fame and Alberta order of excellence with three peace prizes. Gasali, I please welcome our guest. Yeah, that, 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 this is a very hard one. Um, I have so much respect for uh, Chief Willie Littlechild. I also love for everyone else in this lineup. Uh, but um, this, whenever you listen, you, you see Chief, Chief Littlechild in a room, um, you pay uh, you pay your respects, and you pay your respect. And also, what I what I also see is that whenever he talks, everyone is silent. Uh, whether it is MREP, Permanent Forum about like he brings so much knowledge and brings so much um weight and, and and history into every word that he says so i'm very much um yeah very super excited to to bring in um chief woolly little child into this conversation um and just start off with your the, maybe like with the first question chief um how are you doing what's on your mind during the last 100 days, um, how have you been na navigating this pandemic? All right. Uh, oh, you're still on mute, sir. Oh boy. Willie, do you have a microphone, red microphone in down in the bottom of your computer? So click there. Well, there, Gazali, you can unmute uh, Willie from the. Well, I can only ask to unmute. I cannot unmute him uh, myself. I can only ask to unmute. Okay. Hold on. Can somebody call it? <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's trying. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay, I think I've got it. Okay, thank you very much uh, for those kind words. And also good morning to everyone or good afternoon for some. Uh, first, let me thank uh, all of you who are responsible for this um, critically and very important, uh, I'll say, a timely masterminding conversation. It's overdue, but it's not too late uh, to put our thoughts together on the now. Uh, our old people have always told us, uh, you must know where you came from yesterday to know where you are today, if you're going to know where you're going tomorrow. So for the last hundred days, uh, my mind has been on gratitude. Uh, gratitude, being thankful for the wisdom of our elders who have long held on to our traditional laws and our ways of being well. Thinking also and uh, praying for our brothers and sisters who have been devastated by the coronavirus, COVID-19. How we at the Muscogee's Cree Nation have navigated the pandemic 
was to rely on our traditional teachings and by the implementation of our rights. As some of you will know, um, we have an international treaty with Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland. And that dates back to 1876, 1877. But in that treaty, there's a treaty right to health. And in the wisdom of our elders back in 1876 and 1877, when they were negotiating the treaty, they also argued for a pestilence and famine clause so that should there be any uh, future um, uh, famine or pestilence uh, or a calamity such as we have today, then there was a clause there to uh, protect our, uh, the members of uh, Treaty 6. And uh, so with our traditional ceremonies, we invoked a state of emergency immediately in our territory, calling and invoking these articles of treaty. Uh, we also relied on traditional medicines, our traditional medicines as are included in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And uh, utilizing our inherent right to self-government and self-determination, uh, we were very st strict and disciplined among ourselves in how we dealt with the uh, uh, situation with an emergency response team. We had volunteers uh, assisting uh, our elders, taking care of those that needed help. But to make a long story short, relying on our creator's gifts, the four nations of the Muscatese Cree, we still have ongoing prayer ceremonies. The four nations, we just finished our um, second Sundance this past uh, weekend, a Sundance of uh, uh, Thanksgiving and prayer. And I mentioned those because for us in the Four Nations, a community of 18,000, we have absolutely zero cases of the virus. And I believe firmly that it was because of the indigenous perspective of health. We look at health from a holistic perspective. Uh, yes, it was an economic crisis. Yes, it was a health crisis. But for us, we, of course, we look at it from a physical and mental and cultural and very importantly, spiritual uh, perspective when we talk about health. So um, it was uh, very gratifying to date. And of course, we keep praying that among our 18,000 members, we still have no cases uh, at all. So for me, it's been one of gratitude, uh, a thanksgiving to the wisdom of our elders who protected us by way of treaty uh, back uh, over 140 years ago now. So uh, that's what's been on my mind. It, it was one a mixed emotion, yes, because it's yet one of gratitude and yet one of uh, concern about our brothers and sisters who have been devastated by the virus. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Chief. And I, I absolutely love um, that, 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 that gratitude um, is something that, that, that it has been in, your, in the back of your mind the whole time. Um, and thank you, thank you for, for um, describing the situation of Mascochis. Um I had the privilege of being there for, for, uh, for a while, like a couple of days. Um, zooming in a little bit on your, your, your almost 40 plus years of being in the indigenous movement, um, and this has been a question actually that's been on my mind for ever since I, I've gotten to know you, Chief. Um, and maybe I'm asking this question because maybe also because to give young Indigenous persons permission um, to think about this um, as in what is that the biggest mistake that you thought would be a major accomplishment but turned into like a, a huge, a huge miss? Um, is there anything that comes to mind that you feel comfortable talking about? 
Yes, I think for me, uh, um, I like to think positive and I'm still working on this uh, big mistake. Uh, I was trying to um, convince Canada to put national legislation in place to implement the UN Declaration. And of course, uh, um, so far I've, I've missed on that, I've failed on that. Um, but also secondly, um, it's a twofold answer because the second um, desire I had was to convince Canada to put into national legislation uh, a national council for reconciliation. So these two, um, um, I call them mistakes as well, a, a misreading, I will say, I guess, of uh, the response I would get uh, from governments, especially, and from private industry in some cases, uh, from our own people in, in, in other cases, uh, that I wanted to see national legislation in Canada to implement the UN Declaration and also to have an oversight mechanism on that implementation by creating a national council uh, for reconciliation. But I'm still working on that, so hopefully, uh, uh, next time we talk, I can say, uh, yes, we, 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 we hit the target. We didn't miss it. it took a long time, it looked a lot of patience, but uh, uh, so uh, that's what I reflect on. How do I keep working on this so that um, uh, it, it becomes a, a success uh, in the future? Well, any, any way that I can help, Chief, uh, just let me know. Uh, you have my contacts. Um, mm -hmm. I know that because um, in the in the, in, the, in the introduction said that you're like avid uh, sportsman. Um, what in your view, what role does indigenous does sports play in indigenous governance and diplomacy? And maybe like a second part of it is that like what would like to see you to see happen, happening. Well, it's, it's, sports has been my life actually. Uh, and uh, offered many times the, the uh, thanks that sports uh, actually saved my life. So the role of sport in traditional games, I believe, plays a very important contribution in a number of ways to Indigenous rights. Uh, actually, sports and traditional games are human rights. Article 31 of the UN Declaration and it's also included in the OAS Declaration. Uh, it's a reference to um, sports and traditional games. Indeed, Article 31 uh, states in part that Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions as well as the manifestations of that. And one of the manifestations of our culture is sports and traditional games. And I often argue that it's actually about a celebration of life. That's what sport and traditional games um, mean to me. And it fundamentally, very fundamentally also, it's an important element of our right to self-determination. Because when we conduct our games, for example, if you use the Olympic model, uh, where else can we fly our own traditional flags? Where else can we own um, our own songs and sing and dance uh, in an opening ceremonies, for example? Uh, so sport um, uh, is important because it assists us in uh, uh, achieving uh, our right to self-determination in a different uh, way of approach. But what I'd like to see is um, states incorporate the second part of Article 31. And Article 31, uh, since Canada has, for example, uh, uh, adopted the declaration without any qualifications, uh, it, it calls on them and all states, of course, in conjunction with indigenous peoples, that states shall take effective measures 
to recognize and protect and exercise these rights. So since um, Canada supports the declaration without qualification, I think now it must include adequate financial and human resources. After all, every child, um, indeed every person has a right to play and a right to be happy. So while some may not hold sport as an important thing or traditional games as an important uh, element of self-determination, uh, I believe it's um, a unique and important way of uplifting our rights because it brings peoples together. It brings peoples together either in, in friendly competition or cultural exchange and so on uh, to learn from each other. So yes, I, uh, I really believe that uh, sport has an important uh, role to advance uh, not only peace as a theme, but also to advance reconciliation. Um, in in uh, tagging into that, uh, what is the yeah how we call it how, the system mindset that you see that is preventing Indian peoples from making um, the advantage that they want to see at the international level? Well, I think one of the barriers um, that I see. Um, and I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this, is that the, that the mindset that I believe is presenting us from making the advances that we want to make in the international arena um, is actually how we interact or not interact with each other. Sometimes we have a common target and we don't want to work together or we tear each other down. And uh, I'm reminded of, uh, of the Mayan prophecies during the Bakhtun ceremonies to end the uh, long count calendar of uh, 5,000 years when the spiritual leaders in an all nights fire ceremony uh, said goodbye to grandfather's son and said hello to baby son in the morning as the sun came up. Uh, and with a new calendar. During that prayer ceremony that evening, um, they predicted a new era and a new energy. And they said that things will get better for indigenous peoples if four things happen. Firstly, they said that spirituality has to come back to leadership. Secondly, um, women and the role of women uh, will become more prominent in leadership. And thirdly, a uh, very important message, I think, is that we need to build on the strengths of our people. And the last one is the hardest one. It's hard because we've experienced it. And they said, if we want things to be better for Indigenous peoples in the future, we must work very very hard on unity, on working together. Uh, put it in another way, one of our Cree elders uh, said, we must begin to lift each other up, lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. And I used to have a coach uh, by the name of Claire Drake. He since passed on his sp spiritual journey, but he would say to us, it's amazing what can be accomplished if no one cares who gets the credit. And I think that's where uh, uh, those kind of thoughts, thought patterns uh, need to be taken into account um, by ourselves and be willing to put our differences aside as a nine-year-old boy instructed us recently, let's put our differences aside and begin to work together um, and I think that'll be the key to having greater success. Because upon reflection uh, to the last 42 years, we've actually accomplished a tremendous amount. But going forward, where we are now today, we can accomplish more. 
But I think what will be required of us is to uh, to actually really work together. Hmm. And I think I already know the answer to this, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, the, the final question is, um, what do we need to do today so that we don't regret doing it in six to 12 months? I believe what we need to do today is so that we don't um, regret it in the coming months is to follow the advice of our spiritual leaders, our spiritual elders. For example, let's begin to build on the strengths of our people. Our people are very talented, as was said earlier by Lila. It's, it's, it's that um, action of building on those strengths of our people. Our elders have told us that lift each other up so that we can support each other and also continue on this pattern of masterminding uh, a plan of action like you're doing. Thank you for starting this, Kazali, because this is important in terms of putting our minds together. No one or nothing can stop us once we have that mastermind um, in place, except one of us. So we need to continue this kind of um, exchange of views. Um, and also, lastly, as the elders have told us, work very, very hard on, on unity. If we do those and follow those instructions of our elders, I think months from now, we will look back and say, that was a turning point for us, these conversations, because now um, we are working together. We are making change in the new, in the new norm or in the new uh, way with technology and so on. Uh, so let's listen, listen to the elders and act on their advice. And I think that will really um, help us achieve what we want to achieve. We have got, come a long way, but yes, we still have a long way to go. But let's use the traditional advice that we've uh, been given before. Thank you so much, Chief. Um, yeah, any, anything that we did not touch upon that you really want to talk about uh, like for the next, or your thoughts or want in these people to think about um, for the next two minutes? Um, I'm not really sure I have a, a particular um, uh, um, thought in, in, that, in that line. I wish I had a good and easy answer actually to, uh, as to what kind of actionable things uh, people can take, uh, for example, to overcome uh, uh, the intergenerational trauma. Sometimes I think it's about mental health and mental wellness. But uh, other times I think it's about believing in yourself. Uh, having a positive mental attitude. Finding out who you are and being proud of who you are. If at times um, one is stuck in a rut of negativity, think about actually how beautiful a person you are, how gifted a person you are. And then also to be able to seek help when you need it. Because sometimes people think that it's a weakness to seek help, but it's actually a strength um, to, to seek help. Um, and also in, it's in pardoning that we are pardoned and to put it all in one line, uh, um, with all what has happened to our people, globally, indigenous peoples, we're still here and we're still, it's because of our resilience and it's because of our traditional knowledge. And in order to heal um, on an ongoing basis, I think we need to uh, believe also in the power of forgiveness. Yes, we've been hurt, we've been harmed, 
Sometimes we've been uh, assassinated, we've been murdered. Uh, but I think the power of forgiveness will set us another step forward towards advancing uh, uh, reconciliation and peace. Thank you so much, Chief, for ending it with su such a very important topic amongst Indigenous peoples, intergenerational trauma and like mental health. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, um, I'm sorry that we had to end this, but, uh, but definitely hopefully that we can have a longer conversation at some point, hopefully in person, of course, um, so that we can, with, with yourself, Chief, and everyone else um, in this entire lineup, because uh, it's been very uh, inspiring and hopefully also inspiring for all other people um, to listen to all your voices and your ideas.